My name's Zane Newland. I'm an orthopedic surgeon from Oklahoma City. I went to medical school at Oklahoma State University, College of Osteopathic Medicine. I did my traditional rotating internship at Hillcrest Health Center in Oklahoma City, my orthopedic surgery residency at St. Anthony's Hospital in Oklahoma City. I've been practicing in private practice for 17 years. I'm in solo practice, but I share office space with partners in different subspecialties. I have two PAs that work with me um, and approximately 12 people on my staff. So today we're going to talk about the different practice opportunities available to residents as I see them. And those would include uh, solo practice, uh, small group practice, large group practice, hospital employment, um, or a university research position. So when I began my practice 17 years ago, um, most of my peers were joining groups, larger groups. And I chose not to do that because in my opinion, um, senior partners enjoy junior partners for a reason. And that reason is a financial one. So I chose to hang a shingle and start my own practice, which was um, a little bit unusual at that time, much more so unusual uh, in today's uh, environment. Uh, the hospital employment model really didn't exist for specialists at that time, and now it dominates. Um, my understanding is that approximately 75% of residents who finish their training will be employed by a hospital. And it's been uh, proposed to me that all of us will be hospital employees um, at some time in the future. Hopefully I'll be dead before that happens. So obviously beginning a practice from scratch is uh, uh, difficult to do. Um, the question is where are the patients going to come from. The model that I chose was a hospital guarantee model. So I found a hospital that was willing to front me uh, not only uh, a salary but also um, uh, monies for overhead on a per month basis. And the way my contract worked was um, I received the, the overhead amount for a period of six months and the salary guarantee for a period of one year. So it gave myself benchmarks, right? I had six months to create enough revenue to cover my expenses, and then I had an additional six months to cover my expenses and my salary. Absolutely the best thing I did to grow my practice was to be available, right? I always made myself accessible. Gave my cell phone to every primary care doctor who uh, would take it and told them to call me at any time. In fact, I would say, if it's important to you, it's important to me. If it's worrisome to you, it's worrisome to me. Call me about anything, and if it's nothing, then I'll tell you and we'll both be happy. Um, and then also, I, uh, my spoken mantra was if I could get one patient from a primary care provider, and I would treat that patient so well and take such good care of them that they would go back and tell their PCP, and then subsequently I would get all of their patients. I think without question, the most difficult thing about owning your own practice is managing both the business side and the medicine side. Um, you get zero business training in your medical education, both in medical school and in postgraduate training, and that, in my opinion, that's by design, right? Again, those senior partners really enjoy junior partners, so they'd be foolish to train them up uh, to become business savvy uh, physicians, um, which is why I encourage young people, um, college age kids who are interested in medicine, who shadow in my office, I tell them all the time, don't major in biology or zoology or biochemistry like I did, right? Major in business, right? Bec now, if you think that you're gonna eventually work for a hospital and you don't need that business education, then major in something that you enjoy, like the French horn. But um, unless you're gonna teach high school biology, there's really no sense in, in uh, getting a degree, a degree in biology. So the way I see the different types of practice options, um, I count them as four, solo private practice, uh, independent practice in a group, be it large or small, hospital employment, or university slash research. So as I said previously, in my opinion, the most difficult part about running a private practice is managing both the clinical side and the business side. Um, I don't have an extensive education in business, which is to say none, because when I was in undergraduate school, I studied zoology, like many people do. Uh, it's a mistake, in my opinion. Um, but even if I were an astute businessman, um, I don't want to spend my time running my practice. I want to take care of patients. So I hired a uh, friend of mine who's unbelievably intelligent, has an MBA from SMU, and he manages my practice um, at somewhat um, dangerous, right? Because he could literally be robbing me blind and I would have no uh, inkling that that was happening, but I trust him completely. Uh, he has multiple safeguards to check himself that he can present to me even though I never asked to see them. Um, so I feel very confident that's not happening. Historically, uh, people will tell you um, it's not when you're going to lose your first million dollars, but it's not if, but when, 
right? Dealing with office managers and such. It's a, a very difficult, uh, common occurrence. Uh, I've been very fortunate uh, in that way. I feel like I have a, a fantastic office manager who would cut his arm off before he'd steal a penny from me, uh, but I recognize that's very unusual. But the situation I'm in, it allows me just to practice medicine and then not go home at night and run my business. And so most people are not gonna be in that situation, uh, which is gonna make it pretty tough. Well, I think comparing the difficulty between being in private solo practice and being employed, like many things, is multifactorial, right? I mean, you're gonna, there are gonna be pros and cons to each side. Um, with the employment model, you really don't have to do a lot of thinking, right? You just kind of show up and operate on people, and that um, uh, is appealing to many people, right? Not unlike your uh, lay person uh, who just wants to punch a clock and, and punch out at the end of the day, and then he's done. Um, it may not be quite that simplistic, but um, the, the thought, the idea is the same. Whereas if you're in solo practice, private practice, independent practice, then your uh, business is on your mind a lot. I think the greatest thing about being an independent private practitioner is the autonomy, right? I get to do whatever I want to do and when I want to do it and how I want to do it. But that can be bad too, right? If I go on vacation, um, and there's no mice on the wheel uh, spinning it around for me, right, until I get back. So um, pros and cons. So I think that um, the solo practice, just hanging a shingle and going to work, I think that's gone the way of the dinosaur. I, I really don't. When I have these conversations with residents now, I don't even bring that up other than in a historical context because I don't, I don't think that the, uh, the market supports that. I don't think there are enough patients that are not associated with either a hospital system or an existing group, um, I don't think there are enough patients to, to really carve out a true independent solo practice um, anymore. So that leaves, if you're gonna practice independently, that leaves groups. So you have small groups and large groups. And what defines that, I, I don't know. Um, but certainly you can have uh, groups with as many as 30, 40, 50 surgeons. That's definitely a large group. Um, and in my opinion, anything over one is a small group. Um, pros and cons to both of those, right? So uh, in large uh, multi-subspecialty groups, um, if you only want to operate on left shoulders on Tuesday, then that's the type of group that you're going to need to join and hope that all 40 or 50 of those surgeons are going to send you their left shoulders on Tuesdays. Um, if you join a much smaller group, then you are really just in, um, oh, you're a bedfellow with your competition, right? I mean, you guys are both general orthopedic surgeons. You're operating everything on right side, left side, every day of the week, just like your partner is. But the key is sharing overhead, right? You can't be two places at once. I can't be in the clinic and in the operating room at the same time. So I don't need any more space to add one more person. Uh, from an overhead perspective, we don't need any more employees. We just double the production. So it's much more efficient, in my opinion. Um, so I think that it, it depends on the type of practice you want to have, the type of person you want to be. Do you want to operate on shoulders and knees and feet and hands and everything else, or do you just want to operate on elbows? Right? And there's no right or wrong. My experience with joining groups is nil, right? Because I didn't do it. I uh, really didn't even explore it um, very deeply at all. Uh, I had a couple of contracts. Uh, a couple of my trainers uh, were very interested in me joining their group, um, but I really didn't have any interest in doing that. So, um, you know, typically there is a period where you join the group and uh, you're kind of checking each other out, like an engagement per se. Um, and then you're offered an opportunity to purchase into the group, but I really can't speak to that um, with any um, authority. So the benefits of being in a private group, um, which is essentially your only option if you uh, don't want to be a researcher at a university or be employed by a hospital, is uh, the patient population, right? That's what every surgeon needs is patients to operate. So um, if you join a group that's been in existence for 50 years or 100 years, then they've been taking care of uh, patients for a long, long time. And so um, 
depending on the size of the group, right, you may come into that large group and fill a need that the group has, a subspecialty need, whether it be it spine or shoulder and elbow or foot and ankle, whatever the case may be. Uh, maybe someone's retired um, or maybe, um, maybe it's just a, a subspecialty that they've never had in the group and there's an opportunity for you. So you can show up and from day one, the idea is that all of these, your partners, your potential uh, partners send you this particular type of patient. Doesn't always work that way, right? Sometimes it does and that's great, right? If you're a total joint guy and you show up to a large group and everybody wants to send you their total joints, that's fantastic. But certainly in this market, you'll find that, um, well, like myself, I haven't done a total joint fellowship, but I do lots of total joints and particularly skinny, easy total joints, right? I would be, if I were in a group, it'd be hard for me to uh, send out a 110 pound total knee replacement to the new joint guy. I don't know that I would do that. Maybe I'm not fit for group practice. So in my opinion, um, the most difficult thing about joining a group is that typically they're gonna offer you a salary guarantee. You're gonna come out and you just finished your program and you don't have any money and you'd like to get some. So they're gonna offer you a salary and you're gonna think that looks pretty good. And then you're gonna come out and you're gonna to go to work and very quickly you're gonna realize that you're generating a lot more revenue than they're giving to you. And you don't like that and um, then you have discussions about joining the group and taking advantage of the next guy that comes out of his training program. Okay, so as to the question of uh, generating new business and um, finding new patients, it's, it's difficult, it's not easy. And I think that many um, residents think that once they finish their training and they go into practice that the patients are just gonna show up. And it typically doesn't work that way, certainly not in private practice, right? So if you are employed by a hospital and the hospital has a large network of patients, then they're gonna feed you patients and that would be a, an obvious benefit of going that route. Um, but if you go into private practice, whether it's group practice or solo practice, um, you're gonna have to get the patients, right? They're not just gonna show up. And that's why I said earlier that um, the way I did it was to treat my patients so good that they're not only gonna tell all of their friends, but they're gonna tell their, their PCP. Right? And he's gonna say, well, maybe I'll send him another patient. Right? You do that enough time, times, and then uh, eventually you get all of that guy's uh, patients. But you have to be willing to do that. You know, and you have to go out and see them. Go uh, many, many times. Even now, 17 years into my career, if there are new opportunities, I'll get in my car at lunch and go out and meet someone. Uh, now, uh, it's interesting because they really don't want to see you. They're busy too, right? Um, but just showing up, right, and leaving your card at the front desk and saying, hey, here's my cell phone number on the back of it. If you have any orthopedic issue or question, call me. It means a lot, right? But a lot of guys won't do that. I've got a lot of colleagues, a lot of peers that thought they wanted to be in private practice and they simply refused to do that. Not only in orthopedics, but in every subspecialty, surgical specialty. Uh, and it's baffling to me, right? It's not... Um, you know, uh, orthopedics in your community, whether it's Oklahoma City or anywhere else, has been going on for a long time before you show up. And so to think that you're just gonna show up and all these patients are gonna come beat down your door, that just simply doesn't happen, right? It takes effort. Um, but if you put the effort in and you do a good job and take good care of people, then they'll keep coming. So if we're talking about hospital employment, there are uh, obviously multiple hospital systems and organizations. You have for-profit hospitals, not-for-profit hospitals, universities, um, government hospitals, uh, Indian health hospitals. Um, I've worked for none of those. I've, I'm in independent private practice, so I, I really can't speak um, with any intelligence on the inner workings of contracts and things of that nature. Um, so from my perspective, I've worked at multiple, uh, I've worked at for-profit hospitals, not-for-profit hospitals. Um, I've worked at Indian hospitals. And so from a clinical side, uh, I don't know that there's a lot of difference, right? Uh, I, I bill and collect my fees at uh, a government hospital just like I do a for-profit hospital. It doesn't make any difference. So um, those designations, in my opinion, are more for the hospital side, how they do their billing and collecting and things of that nature, which really doesn't apply to me. And if I were to be employed by one of those hospital systems, I don't know that it would apply then either, right? Whether I'm being compensated on an RVU basis or a flat contract basis, it is what it is, right? Um, I'm gonna do the work, I'm gonna get paid, um, hopefully, and I don't care how they do their billing and collecting on the back end to generate the revenue um, that I'm producing to turn around and give me some of it.
I perceive an advantage of working for the hospital. Again, I've got zero experience with this, but I've got multiple friends and peers um, that are employed by hospitals or have been employed by hospitals. Um, one or two that want to be employed by hospitals. I don't understand that. But um, what I perceive as a benefit of working for that hospital is that you don't have the business aspect of your private practice to run. Um, maybe uh, you don't have the required education that uh, you didn't get in undergraduate school and certainly didn't get in your uh, postgraduate medical training, uh, or maybe you're just not interested in doing that, right, from a time constraint um, standpoint. It's perfectly reasonable. Uh, or maybe you're just the type of person that uh, would like to just show up and punch a clock and, and then uh, punch out at the end of the day. But it's not like that, right? We said it's, uh, that's an oversimplification of uh, that business model. So even if you are employed, um, you're going to have to, uh, if you want to be successful, you're going to have to make an effort to uh, do a good job, be friendly, uh, and recruit some patients, right? What's going to, I suspect you won't be the only employed orthopedic surgeon at your hospital. And the guy, you know, sitting next to you at the lunch table, he wants to, he wants to do great things too. So if he's working harder than you, if he's friendlier than you, if he's more talented than you, then that's going to be a tough spot for you, right? Um, I think that many times people think they'll just show up to this employed position and, and the waiting room will be filled with patients. I would suggest that that's not typically the case. Another potential perk of being a hospital employee would be student loan forgiveness. Another uh, negative aspect, in my opinion, of working or being an employee of a hospital is the fact that you don't have any autonomy, not only of your own schedule, right, um, but the people that work for you, your MAs, your nurses, your receptionists, um, they don't work for you, they work for the hospital that you work for. So it's, um, on one hand, that's a good thing, right? You don't have to worry with hiring and firing and discipline and you know, uh, performance reviews and things of that nature. Um, but on the other hand, if you don't like the way Sally's looking at you when you ask her to put a cast on, you can't really do anything about that. And I would find that very frustrating, uh, personally. So when we're speaking about hospital employment contracts, again, my experience is zero. Um, but my understanding is there are three basic types. There's a straight salary model, there's an RVU, production-based model, and then there's a hybrid model where you have a base salary and then you'll gain a percentage of your production over and above that that I suspect you would negotiate before signing the contract. Um, but I think that whether you're in private practice or whether you're in an employed physician under any of those scenarios, um, a basic concept that I tell people all the time is that um, you need to work hard, right? If you're not willing to work hard, then you're not going to make a lot of money. And that's got nothing to do with orthopedics, right? I tell people all the time, if you want to make a million dollars digging ditches, you better dig a lot of ditches, right? And it's no different putting total knees in people. So, um, and, you know, life's not about making money. So if you just, if um, you don't want to dig that many ditches, then don't. But what many, in my opinion, what many young physicians do um, when they're training, they see their trainers and the lifestyle that their trainers are living and they aspire to that lifestyle, but then they only want to work from eight to five. They only want to work 40 hours a week. They've got limitations on their training and if they've worked all night in the OR, then their program has to give them 24 hours off to sleep or something, which is probably better for the patient, but that's not the way the real world works. So going back to hospital employment and contracts and the differences therein, uh, or even with private practice, right? The, the crux of the matter is that you have to be real with yourself about number one, what your goals are in life, both from a financial standpoint or a uh, family time or personal time or uh, just whatever makes you tick, right? And make sure that correlates with your willingness to, to work and the opportunities therein. Right, so you wouldn't, uh, if you're a go-getter and you wanna work um, from dusk till dawn uh, overnight, um, then you wouldn't wanna sign a contract that is gonna pay you a set salary regardless of how many cases you do, right? You definitely wanna be on a production-based uh, contract. Um, but uh, having a, a clear understanding that um, not only patients don't just show up in your waiting room, but dollars don't show up in your bank account, right? You have to earn those. 
and they don't earn themselves. The RVU contracts that the hospital may uh, propose to you and tell you that you have an opportunity to do 1,000 or 1,500 RVUs a month, well, that's fantastic, but they don't do themselves. You actually have to do that work, and that takes a lot of time. So if you're willing to uh, sacrifice other areas of your life, uh, literally, um, then you can achieve that. But it's unreasonable to uh, want to collect a salary um, based on 1,500 RVUs a month, but only do 600 RVUs a month. That math just doesn't work.